So good morning, everyone. I can see there are some people filing in. So we'll just uh, give it a couple of minutes while people join us. Okay, I think as that's uh, that's gone 10, I'll start. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. My name's Susan Coftry. I'm Director of the Foreign Policy Centre and uh, really delighted to be hosting this second uh, webinar in the series that we are collaborating together with the Centre for Russian, European and Eurasian Studies at the University of Birmingham and also in cooperation with the OSCE Network of Think Tanks and Academic Institutions. This short series has been exploring the underappreciated impacts of the war in Ukraine. We had the first one um, earlier this month that looked at the relationships with the BRICS. So if you missed that um, and are interested to catch up, you can find that on our website and on our YouTube channel. Um, but delighted today uh, to have a, another fantastic panel that are gonna look at the impact of Russia's war in Ukraine on connectivity in Eastern Europe and the South Caucasus. So without further ado, I'm actually going to hand over to our senior advisor, Craig Oliphant, who's had a wealth of experience working in this region, and I can think of no one better to chair today's conversation. So um, thank you, Craig, and I'll, I'll, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks, Susan. Uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, uh, wherever you're tuning in from. Um, my name is uh, Craig Oliphant, an advisor at the Foreign Policy Centre, and very pleased to to, to be chairing this discussion today. Um, as mentioned by Susan, we at FBC are really grateful for the collaboration with the University of Birmingham, CREES, and the OSC network of think tanks in setting up this uh, webinar today. And uh, we certainly got an excellent uh, lineup of speakers uh, for the discussion. And during the Q&A, um, I will draw also on Professor Stefan Wolf, uh, University of Birmingham priest, to, to offer comments and questions from his perspective on some of the points uh, raised. I think to, to help give more time to the speakers, I will ask each of the panel members uh, to briefly introduce themselves in turn and at the outset of their opening remarks. Uh, perhaps just a, a few housekeeping points initially. Each of our panelists uh, will speak for five to seven minutes, and then in the second half of the webinar, uh, we will open it up out, uh, as I say, to Q&A discussion. Grateful if people online could put their questions in the Q&A function rather than the chat line, and we will draw your points in that way. The, the order in which we will uh, hear the four speakers will be firstly Professor Rilke dragneva uh, whose expertise is in international law at Birmingham Law School and with a specialist focus regionally on Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Uh, then Professor Gire Sadik, who is an international relations professor based in Ankara. Uh, next, Dr. Leila Alieva, who is an affiliate of Russian and East European Studies at Oxford University School for Global and Area Studies, um, as tuning in today from Baku. Uh, welcome, Leila. And uh, finally, uh, from Moldova, it's a pleasure also to welcome uh, Julian Groza, who's the Executive Director of uh, IPRE, which is the Institute for European Policies and Reform in Chisinau. And uh, Julian previously served as a deputy foreign minister um, of Moldova, among other posts held. So welcome all and a very warm welcome to everyone joining online for what promises to be a, a fascinating discussion. If I may, just two or three brief remarks from my side on the importance of the topic. Uh, firstly, Russia's war on Ukraine has variously been seen as a massive game changer, both in the region and also for its wider global effects. But it can also be said, arguably, that um, the war is merely accelerating 
trends that were already underway, uh, for example, with some countries moving uh, more into China's orbit, for example. That is something we could come back to in the discussion, um, namely that the war as an accelerant of pre-existing trends in the region. For, for now, the uncertainty of the direction of Russia's war on Ukraine, uh, a reinvasion of the country, just to remind, compounding what had been unleashed by Russia in 2014, is such that there is no clarity on the end game, uh, nor on the time scale of uh, any outcome, and nor necessarily really um, on the question of whose side time is on. And I'm sure we might come back to some of those issues. But at the forefront, really, of all of our concerns, front and center, is the huge toll of human suffering, the very large number of military and civilian casualties in Ukraine, and the massive demographic um, blow that's uh, incurred also through significant displacement of population, both within the country and those who have been constrained to leave from neighboring countries and further afield disrupting families, and also having, as I say, its own hidden uh, demographic toll in this terrible ordeal. Secondly, um, among the many direct and indirect impacts on the war, um, and of varying degrees and intensity, one that we will be focusing on today, uh, as, as uh, billed by um, uh, Susan in this discussion, is the implications for neighboring countries countries, uh, neighboring region, from the disruption of overland connectivity and of transport uh, corridors and routes in the region. How effective or otherwise, for example, is the sanctions regime against uh, Russia uh, proving? And what effects is it having for established and envisaged corridors um, and trade routes in the region? After the recent G7 summit uh, in Hiroshima, is there any likelihood down the line of secondary sanctions uh, designed to target those deemed to be circumventing uh, restrictions? More broadly and specifically, it has raised a number of questions about the viability and connectivity of the Northern Corridor, which runs through Be uh, Russia and Belarus and makes up an overall 12,000 kilometer uh, overland transport route running from China through Kazakhstan, uh, Russia and Belarus, Poland to Duisburg in Germany. And those questions really on viability have in turn put a spotlight on efforts to develop and galvanize the so-called middle corridor, which is not new, but would require something of a step change uh, in connectors to, to offer a real alternative route bypassing Russia from China across Kazakhstan, the Caspian, the South Caucasus, to Turkey, the Black Sea, and on to EU countries. So very much a subject of the middle corridor uh, that still prompts many more questions and answers among some analysts and regional uh, commentators. But thirdly, and I'll draw my own remarks uh, to a close, but much depends really in all of this, of course, on the role of China and specifically the role uh, China is playing in Central Asia at uh, the, um, uh, uh, is playing both in Central Asia and the South Caucasus, and also the prospects for the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, the BRI, as it's uh, known, in the, in the region. A massive trillion dollar initiative launched 10 years ago by Beijing for a, a network of trade transport routes. And this is a question too for close consideration by our panelists today, namely a consideration of the short-term and long-term implications of the war on the future of Brie across the Caspian, the South Caucasus, Black Sea and beyond. So in winding up a timely, very timely discussion, and not least as the dust is still settling really from the G7 summit in Hiroshima and the Arab League summit, in Saudi Arabia. These were each marked as we saw by a common feature as President Zelensky of Ukraine joined both gatherings in person and interacted variously um, to particular effect with leaders at both summits and with Ukraine indeed rightly dominating proceedings for all three days, certainly at the G7. 
So lots of coverage on that. But really another summit with perhaps less of a spotlight last week was also something of particular significance. And that was China's hosting of an inaugural uh, China Central Asia C5 summit in Xi'an, the historic Chinese uh, city that once marked the start of the fabled Silk Road. All part of Beijing's uh, interface bilaterally and regionally with countries involved uh, in the Belt and Road Initiative. So plenty of themes and issues percolating here from last week's summitry and of great relevance also to our discussions this morning. Without further ado, uh, uh, Rilke, uh, may I hand the floor to you and ask you uh, to just briefly uh, introduce yourself and I understand you will be giving us some of the context on how things stand in all of this for the Eurasia Economic uh, union. Welcome, Rilke. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Rilke Dragneva Lewers, and I'm a professor of international legal studies at the University of Birmingham with a, a long standing interest in economic, um, regional economic integration in the region uh, and Russia's policy vis a vis its neighbors and the broader Eurasian um, region as such. So my focus today will be firstly the uh, Eurasian Economic Union as an organization that uh, for, for many uh, was uh, um, a potentially positive sign in enabling uh, connectivity uh, in the Eurasian region on new principles, um, not only within the Eurasian bloc, but also as a vehicle performing links with the wider Eurasian space, and indeed uh, Putin's um, centerpiece in what became his idea of the Greater Eurasian Partnership. So uh, quite an ambitious project to start with, aiming for a deep, and, uh, econ a deep economic integration achievement of a common market for 180 million people and a bridge from uh, Europe to the Asia Pacific region. Now, as we've seen since, that promise did not materialize, and it's important to state that uh, cracks were already seen well before uh, uh, actually uh, the start of the, the, the war and uh, uh, well before 2014, mm -hmm. when the annexation of Crimea took place. Um, and what we've seen since is that whilst the Eurasian Economic Union um, internally facilitated improved market access and perhaps most importantly, uh, free movement of labor, uh, important for countries such as Kyrgyzstan and Armenia, um, it did not deliver on the potential of actually facilitating deeper connectivity. So um, while it attempted to maintain old networks and Russia's um, dominance over uh, old networks, it did not necessarily lead to investment and positive modernization and development um, needing in order to uh, promote uh, growth in transport, logistics, infrastructure. Um, Similarly, what we saw, especially after 2014, is unraveling a lot of, a lot of the achievements of uh, the Eurasian Economic Union, for example, in relation to the functioning of the customs union um, and uh, the reintroduction of barriers between different member states of the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, so we've already seen problems uh, and uh, kind of politicization of uh, the processes, um, Russia's desire to maintain on the one hand a free reign uh, and uh, depart from undertakings um, when it wants to um, uh, protect its, its broader political and geopolitical interests, but also a desire to keep other powers at bay, but at the same time, not actually making the necessary investment uh, financial, administrative, um, and basically uh, interest in practical implementation of these initiatives, which meant that a lot of cracks were already appearing. So what we have seen with the start of the war is um, 
Obviously, as, as Craig already indicated, the disruption of the um, overland connectivity by the Northern Corridor, uh, passing through heavily sanctioned Russian and uh, Belarusian territories. Um, so we see uh, very important implications for, for Russia's partners and its neighbors. Um, for Russia's partners, uh, this whole participation and duration uh, union has always been a bit of a Faustian bargaining uh, process. Um, on the one hand, they have been consistently sensitive to Russia's hegemony. On the other hand, they have been interested in obtaining certain benefits uh, from being um, uh, in a close relationship with Russia. Um, what we've seen, however, is that Firstly, a lot of the sensitivities have increased as a result of the war. So um, Russia's shift to coercion, blatant challenge to sovereignty was noted. Um, I mean, it's in a way one can say um, the latest updated foreign policy doctrine uh, of the Russian Federation doesn't do anything to placate the uh, sensitivity um, arising from various statements um, uh, with regard to the sovereignty of, let's say, uh, Kazakhstan, known for having large um, uh, sections of, of uh, Russian ethnic population. Um, so that has made the kind of position of, of these partner countries a bit more precarious. At the same time, they have experienced direct costs from the disruption of um, logistical and, and, and trading routes. Uh, so on the one hand, trade with Russia has become more difficult. On the other hand, uh, it's basically the transit position. So there's been a need to bypass Russian um, infrastructure uh, uh, for, for these uh, landlocked countries it, that it has been per particularly difficult, not only because of the increased cost of shipment to global markets, but also because of the uncertainty of being exposed to Russia's action, which we've seen um, a number of examples of uh, it being quite fickle. Um, there have been a number of benefits in the sense of um, uh, there have been new opportunities to uh, profit from uh, developing alternative routes um, and Russia's effort to uh, um, enable parallel imports and uh, bypass uh, sanctioned routes. Um, that, however, has, of course, brought the risk of, of secondary sanctions. Um, so what we have seen is, again, this, uh, the, uh, Russia's partners playing this dip, the tight, walking this tight diplomatic, uh, a difficult diplomatic tightrope. Um, on the one hand, um, they have been very keen to uh, signal compliance with um, the sanction, international sanction regime. Um, as you know, started going back to July 2022, there was a prohibition of export of uh, sanctioned goods through Kazakhstan, for example. Um, Kazakhstan, again, uh, has engaged in regular consultations with Western partners. And most recently, in the beginning of April, they've introduced an online system of, of tracking um, goods going in and out of the country. Um, at the same time, um, it, there, there has been an increase of, of um, about 25% last year of uh, exports from Kazakhstan to Russia. And as a recent report of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development shows, there has been a lot of intermediated trade going on, um, particularly in, in, in goods such as advanced semiconductors, bearings, pipes, and so on. So um, a, a, a complicated dynamic there. Um, and this diplomatic type trope is particularly difficult also because of Russia's changed ex expectations with the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, while it couldn't be said that uh, up to a few years back, um, we could see already a dip in, in the kind of interest following the launch of the Eurasian Economic, economic Union, there was a bit of a dip in interest in it. Um, from Russia, certainly a dip in interest in 
um, kind of improving the difficult practical technical aspects to make it work. Um, Putin's latest speeches, for example, January 2023 to the heads of the Eurasian Economic Union countries, uh, indicates three important uh, shifts. Firstly, a shift to actually rationalizing the Eurasian Economic Union from a sort of functional technocratic uh, um, exercise in regional economic integration to more sort of ethno-historical type of justifications for the Eurasian Economic Union. Second, emphasizing the role of the Eurasian Union in helping Russia uh, become self-sufficient and independent. So there is this whole shift of, of narrative from connectivity to self-sufficiency and independence. Uh, and seeing the Eurasian Economic Union as a hub uh, in a kind of alternative system, creating alternative processes, financial, technological, and so on, to the existing Western, um, well, Western-dominated, per perceived as Western-dominated international systems. So there's been a lot more pressure or indication that there will be a lot more pressure for deepening of the Eurasian Economic Union in more kind of political directions. So that really leaves Russia's parties in a quite a difficult situation. Um, and I'm happy to expand on, on those dilemmas in the discussion. Rilke, Rilke, thank you so much for those uh, fascinating insights and also about uh, some of the shifting narrative there as well, which I'm sure we'll come back to. Um, I think what we'll do is, is press on and take all four speakers opening remarks together and then, as I say, come to the Q&A. In, in passing the floor now to uh, Gire, I would just um, really urge uh, people on the call, uh, if you want to Put your questions, please go to the Q&A function. I might just remind that all the panelists will be with us till 11.30 uh, UK time today. Uh, Gire has to leave just slightly earlier, so if you want to, if you're prompted to ask a question of Gire, please uh, get that in early. Gire, uh, floor is yours and please introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Craig, and uh, I thank the organizers for the organization and inviting me to that panel along with um, very respected, distinguished panelists. I am Giray Sadik. I am professor at Ankara Yildirim Beyazıt University. I am also director of European Studies Research Center and chair of the Department of International Relations. Uh, my research centers on European foreign and security policy also related on issues uh, about countering hybrid threats, connectivity on a broader sense from uh, maritime, land, energy, and enhancing resilience and hybrid capacity building to sum it up. And at the same time, I'm representing my university at OSC network of academic institutions and think tanks and I am among its elected steering members. So that is my uh, brief introduction. Coming to uh, my talk, which follows uh, Rilke's presentation and very relevant in that regard, it is about the rise of the Middle Corridor, which is among the most significant geopolitical developments uh, after, uh, after the Ukraine war. So Middle Corridor, that idea has been uh, there for a while, but uh, the European attention to that Middle Corridor enhanced, uh, especially for two reasons after the war in Ukraine. Number one, it's a regional economic zone connecting Turkey, South Caucasus with Central Asia, broadly speaking. And following to that, uh, it is, the most direct route from China to Europe. As you see behind, I put the map of Middle Corridor. The red line uh, is the Middle Corridor. In the north, there is called Northern Corridor. In the south, Southern Corridor with more maritime links. Therefore, uh, in light of the Northern Corridor has become um, 
largely unusable due to wave of sanctions uh, that become effectively only functioning recently between Russia and Belarus. So very limited global connection with some uh, Chinese parts also maybe. But uh, when it comes to Western sanctions and therefore supply chain security, the rise of the middle corridor is clearly uh, visible as it is in the map. There are two lines basically. One is uh, after Central Asia, Caspian Sea, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and then via Georgia, it can be a land route such as Baku Tbilisi Jehan railway or pipelines via Turkey and then to Mediterranean and then to EU. Or a maritime route from Georgia connecting it with Romania uh, and then Romania as EU member uh, diversifying the rest of that. That is why connectivity, I think, need to be considered in a broadest possible sense. Uh, not only land bridge, not only pipelines, but it goes anywhere from food to cyber to maritime security. And in light of war, those are likely to uh, be more stressed and therefore uh, more important. Something to add with Craig's uh, earlier remarks, game changer. Craig, here I am definitely on the game changer part of the war. Because even if there are some already undergoing trends, such as Belt and Road Initiative of China or Middle Corridor and other uh, relevant projects, uh, they were there and their role is needs to adapt. But uh, Russian war in Ukraine is also game changer for those uh, already started projects. Therefore, as all of us, they also need to uh, to be adapted to those changing war uh, realities. And therefore, we need to be all open up for contingencies, increasing resilience and hybrid capacity building against hybrid threats. And finally, keep our expectations more reasonable to allow for flexible adaptation in light of changing geopolitical uh, realities. Therefore, that reconfiguration of connectivity uh, needs to be considered in light of all those factors and therefore uh, needs to put us in a humble position in terms of uh, our expectations from the potential uh, of those connectivity projects in the short term and uh, in the long term to invest more in resilience regardless of the war outcome or ending uh, we need to think about resilience in terms of diversifying uh, our supply chains it's not only about energy energy security it's also about food security as ukraine is one of the major food producers of grain and that is important to remember that recently renewed grain deal uh, with good offices of Turkey and the UN facilitation. Adding that in the war zone with Russia, an important producer, producer of fertilizers as well, that makes it an issue for global food security as well. Um, in light of those, still, uh, when it comes to middle corridor, there are three uh, common elements that uh, need to be considered for uh, uh, EU and Turkey that share interest in enhancing Eurasian connectivity. Number one is uh, to promote regional peace and stability, especially in the Caucasus, but also after Ukraine war around those days, if you follow with developments in Kazakhstan, you see that soft spots are not limited to Black Sea or Caucasus. They can uh, or they have risks of escalating in other theaters. Number two, increase resilience of European supply chains. And number three, diversify European supplies, which also helps all that cooperation to balance Russian, Chinese and Iranian influence in Central Asia. Uh, another issue we need to uh, we need to keep in mind when thinking about connectivity. So, as Ukraine war 
is not limited to Ukraine. In essence, connectivity issue is also not limited to just the actors on the line or on the middle corridor, but uh, it has far reaching consequences, economic, geopolitical, and uh, overall global consequences ranging from all the way from uh, from the Far East Indo-Pacific to the UK and beyond, because we need to consider those uh, those corridors always in light of their alternatives. Similarly, uh, that is also related with the effectiveness of sanctions. That is why EU need to introduce a number of or waves of sanctions on top of each other, and we can expect them to come more as this is kind of tightening. Your sanctions are as good as your alternatives to survive with, without those sanctions or with those sanctions are, um, uh, are in place. Uh, that is why uh, those are all interrelated issues. And recently, the China uh, gathering uh, Central Asian five republics. My short comment or take to initiate questions, maybe, it will be, uh, rather than looking who is invited, let's look who is not invited, which is a country in the region, which is Russia is not invited. That shows uh, that power vacuum in the region, uh, China is eager and willing and have already started to filling that gap. Uh, this can be also, an, uh, in addition to reading the BRI repercussions, but uh, that is my preliminary reading. To allow more time for uh, Q&A, uh, mm -hmm. I will now uh, stop here. I see the chair as well, and uh, I welcome further questions. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, yeah, really important points you made there about resilience in supply chains and also uh, diversification issues. Um, I'm sure there'll be several points we'll come back to. And I certainly have a, a burning question that I will come to you probably first with uh, after we've heard the other two speakers. May I seamlessly move on to uh, Leila now, um, Leila Aliyeva in, uh, currently in Baku. Well, thank you so much. I've been living in the UK for the last eight years. Um, so um, I, I'm affiliate of the Oxford University, uh, Russian East European Studies, uh, as already was mentioned. I think the war in Ukraine raised a few questions. Um, for me, uh, two are particularly interesting. Um, when connectivity has a value of a factor against the instability and military adventures. And is connectivity <clears throat> a way or a tool of interdependence and cooperation rather than dependency and control? And uh, I suppose the answer to these questions uh, is almost evident. Uh, it's a major lesson learned from the uh, Ukrainian conflict. It probably, as we already mentioned, the previous speakers, di diversification of supplies, routes, markets, and strategic connectivity also, which took place in the 90s. Um, and in this regard, because as a result of Ukrainian war and sanctions, uh, there are significant changes um, uh, which led to bypass routes. Um, Kazakhstan directs its oil via Caspian, Baku Belisi Jehan, Azerbaijan. Uh, China is becoming, has become uh, one of the major players in the global uh, shift in this regard. I, I would say that South Caucasus goes through the second stage of the process, which I called uh, many years ago, reshaping Eurasia. Um, uh, the first one took place in the 90s, and I would like just briefly give uh, the comparison between the two processes. The first dealt with energy security, um, and it was built on the initiative uh, although led by the US, but it was built also on the initiative and enthusiasm of the local actors, 
um, who were um, eager to change post-colonial architecture. So it uh, was about diversification of energy supplies to the West. The risks were lower uh, because uh, Russia since then from Yeltsin's meddler uh, sort of policy uh, transformed into Putin's aggressors policy. So the risks were higher in this regard. And uh, there are new independent actors Turkey became more independent regional actor and China stepped in. Uh, the first uh, process of reshaping Eurasia was led by the US, while now EU is more prominent. And um, nowadays, even traditional ally of Russia, Armenia changed, changing its orientation uh, after the revolution. Uh, war in Ukraine has also um, restricted ambitions of some actors like Azerbaijan, who was planning, as you know, to become the regional hub from all directions, north, south, and west um, and east. Uh, and uh, uh, this was helped by the EU and world communities uh, sanctions which restrict power of Russia, in a sense, uh, pushing the countries towards the uh, choices, certain choices. And uh, the connectivity uh, between strategic partners were characteristic, uh, like Guam, for instance, in the 90s. While now the connectivity is a result already of restricted alternatives due to the war in Europe, um, also partly affected by the uh, uh, agreement after the war in Karabakh in 2020. But there are certain commonalities also. They both took place against the background of unresolved conflicts. Uh, the uh, certain conflicts uh, are still unresolved in the South Caucasus. And although the urgency of diversification is more acute nowadays, there is some tension between short-term business considerations versus long-term political and security interests. In the uh, 90s, uh, I witnessed a serious resistance to the Baku Tbilisi Jehan project uh, from the side of multinational corporations. Uh, who were arguing that this is uh, this goes contrary to the commercial considerations and it will never take place, but the political considerations and long term uh, sort of uh, policy uh, goals they took uh, over, they won. And similarly, uh, Turkish uh, companies are unhappy with Azerbaijani route uh, due to the high tariffs. And uh, some argue that it is the major reason why Kalich Daroglu recently was showing the um, map which shows that uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, Silkway, uh, the Silkway uh, route uh, bypasses um, Caucasus. Um, and of course, the similar issue is competition of regional trends of integration versus European or Western and vulnerability of the South Caucasus vis-a-vis -vis Russia's threat. With all the uh, com common and united policy of uh, the United West um, against Russia, uh, West still did not prove uh, to provide a counterbalance to Russia's direct threat, uh, not only in the South Caucasus, but even in Europe. So that was a awareness uh, which came uh, to the, uh, uh, the um, uh, leaders of the South Caucasus gradually after the 90s. Um, uh, let me stop here, and um, I will um, probably answer to more specific questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Leila. And in, indeed, um, if I may, later, I'd just like to come back to um, get your insights on, on uh, Georgia's 
uh, role and place at the moment um, uh, in the context of, of the Ukraine war. Um, finally, um, if we now um, offering a perspective from Moldova, could go to Julian Groza. Um, uh, Julian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Craig, and thank you for organizing this uh, discussion. Um, I'll uh, try to refer in, uh, to three points, basically. Uh, the first one is that uh, the Russian war against Ukraine has uh, impacted a lot, uh, uh, not only the security, but uh, of course, uh, the uh, logistics and transportation uh, through the Black Sea uh, towards Europe and other places. And Moldova, uh, while being the most effective country after Ukraine, of course, feels a, a lot of pressure as well. From the first days of the war, uh, we had seen uh, a lot of the, uh, the impact of this disruption of the logistics from the port of Odessa, which was main main hub uh, for the region here in Moldova as well. Uh, um, we felt the pressure because uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, land transportation, railway transportation, was had to go to through Moldova, and. Uh, we had seen uh, uh, long lines of uh, lorries uh, 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 waiting uh, uh, at the broader uh, crossing points with uh, with the EU, with Romania. Uh, as well, we have seen uh, a need uh, for um, upgrading the railway infrastructure uh, to make sure that to help uh, to provide new uh, opportunities for uh, Ukrainian products uh, to trans uh, to transit Moldova towards uh, towards EU and uh, uh, ports in uh, in Romania, um, and uh, in, uh, as part of this uh, basically uh, uh, process, uh, <clears throat> Moldova joined the uh, solidarity lanes uh, with the EU, of course, and uh, uh, Ukraine, Moldova, uh, and the EU uh, have been looking for um, not only um improving uh, the institutional setup um, but also looking at the infrastructure as well and uh, in a, a rather short notice uh, we have seen a rehabilitation of the railroad uh, interconnections in the south to help improve uh, the uh, the transit um the same has been uh, currently being done with romania there is another um, bridge which is being uh, floating bridge which is being installed uh, with Romania to help to diversify routes uh, but beyond that, of course, uh, beyond the infrastructure uh, aspects, we also have the um, procedures. And I think what helped a lot uh, first for Ukraine is to join the Common European uh, Transit Convention. This is something that Moldova is also looking into. Also last year, um, Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia joined the European transport community, again, to help uh, to include uh, uh, our countries into uh, policies and, and 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 funding projects of the EU to increase connectivity, and this is exactly what happened uh, recently. Um, Moldova uh, uh, also joined the uh, Connecting Europe facility, uh, which helps now to look into the additional funding to upgrade the not only the transport infrastructure, but uh, but also looking to other uh, connectivity uh, aspects like digital and energy. Um, one more point about connectivity and how that uh, basically how the war impacted all of us here is is just to give a word on the energy because that is also relevant. Uh, a few few days after the war started, Ukraine and Moldova connected to uh, NSOE uh, grid, um, and that helped uh, not only uh, uh, Ukraine but also Moldova to seek alternatives uh, of supply of electricity. Uh, given the uh, you know the attacks of the Ukrainian critical infrastructure by Russians, uh, blackouts, which you also felt in Moldova as well, so that was very important. Um, now, uh, mm, final point I want to make is that uh, uh, the connectivity topics uh, uh, have been uh, also uh, addressed in the uh, last uh, European uh, Political Community Summit, which was held in Prague. Uh, a part of peace and security uh, energy aspects we have been addressed, but also uh, uh, have been touched to the aspects of connectivity. Now, uh, in Moldova on the 1st of June, we will host the second uh, European Political Community Summit and uh, connectivity interconnections is one of the three topics which will be uh, further addressed. 
that is uh, uh, important uh, again to um, use the opportunity of uh, this high-level interaction among European leaders to in increase uh, and to better connect Europe uh, from north to south, from uh, west to east, uh, and try to respond to the immediate needs. And also, when uh, discussing, uh, uh, you know, the the, fu the future developments and the reconstruction uh, re re reconstruction of Ukraine. Um, these uh, initiatives, uh, uh, upgrading solidarity lanes or, you know, bridging the gaps across Europe from uh, through transport connectivity uh, projects, um, which are now being included, updated in the connecting facility, uh, may help uh, to better bridge uh, the existing gaps uh, between the region and, and the rest uh, of, uh, of, the, of, of Europe. And also, as mentioned, not less important beyond infrastructure is the procedures, custom procedures, transportation, transit transportation procedures. That is uh, very important when looking at the timing uh, and the efficiency of the transport of goods. Um, and this uh, uh, also is relevant to the exchange of information between the countries uh, in the region as well uh, to create more, again, more interconnected Europe and to enhance you know, solidarity among European states. Uh, last point, I think, which is relevant, uh, we're looking towards the funding, uh, of course, and looking to, towards, you know, the reconstruction of Ukraine in the future, uh, uh, which shall be also debated in the upcoming summit uh, from, from our perspective, is to look into the risk insurance mechanisms for investment beyond, you know, funding, which is provided by various, uh, uh, you know, international financial institutions. Um, uh, we need uh, to encourage uh, to develop a risk insurance mechanism, which would uh, help, uh, you know, uh, boost more investments in infrastructure projects uh, in the region. Uh, and this may encourage uh, partnerships uh, among private sector, you know, governments, international financial institutions, uh, and that may be something which uh, should uh, we all look at. Thank you. With that, I will conclude, and of course, I'll be more than happy to uh, the Q and A session to look for the Q and A session. Thank you. Julian, uh, thank you so much uh, for that overview. Very uh, rich in details. And um, I'd certainly like to come back, if I may, to um, the uh, upcoming uh, European uh, Political Community uh, Summit and uh, some of the expectations there. Uh, we already have questions uh, coming in online. And um, I am mindful that uh, Gire uh, will be with us through to 11 o'clock UK. So I wondered if I could just abuse the chairman's prerogative and maybe initially throw uh, a couple of questions to Gire. And then I, I just have a, a cluster of questions more generally for the panel that I'll follow up, up on. But it was just to give a chance um, to come back here. I mean, Gire, um, as you were saying on the middle corridor, uh, it's um, uh, um, on the one hand a kind of a more direct route from China to Europe, but as a route, it features several more border crossings than the Russian route, as well as the need for multimodal transfers, you know, with the Caspian and the Black Sea. And I know connectors are going in here, but I just wondered if you could say a bit more about the challenges around costs and relative slowness, or maybe that is not how you see the situation. And a second corollary one um, is uh, something we've not mentioned in here is this um, north-south <laughs> uh, corridor. I mean, with uh, great fanfare two weeks ago, um, uh, the Russians and Iranians have announced um, uh, a, um, uh, an agreement on uh, a, a railroad uh, connectivity there. Do you, Gire, see any um, complementarity uh, between the middle corridor and the north-south corridor, or would you say they are kind of uh, exclusive? Thanks in the first instance, if you could come back on that, thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, those are indeed very relevant questions. Starting from your second question, uh, complementarity, as I touched upon, and that's the reason I put the map, all those corridors are relevant vis-a-vis um, -vis each other or uh, based on their interrelationships because the amount of volume of trade, however restricted at the end of the day, 
you need to transfer it. You cannot use the upper route, you have to use the southern route more. You cannot use the middle corridor, you need to use the maritime road from uh, the blue line there even more. So um, they are, they have to be considered together. Whether we may consider them complementary, uh, if there was no war, that could be another issue, especially, for example, the situation of Azerbaijan uh, will be important and increasingly important, regardless of the result of the war or even without war, because it's uh, for the middle corridor a key country and for north-south corridor also it's uh, another key country. We have northern corridor from uh, China up to Germany, the yellow line, but uh, recently another update, which is not on the map, so thank you, Craig, for uh, mentioning that or allowing me to touch on this. Russia, as a way of circumventing sanctions, tries to have another north-south corridor cutting through Caspian Sea, either via Azerbaijan or connecting maritime uh, via Iran and then to the Gulf. Therefore, uh, complementarity, uh, not necessarily, or depending on the actors, such as Azerbaijan, uh, may choose to, if you wish, play both hands or try to uh, uh, substitute one when the other fails to work or fails to consider the legitimate uh, security concerns of Azerbaijan. So uh, that is why uh, regional peace and stability, it is important. And that is why uh, uh, we need to consider that uh, in our efforts uh, in the region. We can be against landmines in Ukraine, but we should also be against landmines planted by illegal Armenian occupation in Azerbaijan. Still, that is the case. I was also OSC observer in Azerbaijan. And um, so we need to keep in mind, we are against illegal occupation of Ukraine by Russians, yes, but also illegal occupation of Azerbaijan internationally recognized sovereign territory of Azerbaijan as well. Coming to uh, your uh, second question, Craig, can you please briefly remind me the second question? We're really, uh, no, it, it was mainly about um, the issue of costs and um, slowness through the middle corridor route. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, thank you. I now remember uh, I took note. Yes, that is important. This is why I also took note. There will be uh, opportunities will always come with challenges and benefits with certain costs and risks. And uh, the war in Ukraine make all those even more pressing. What I mean uh, is that Lots of border crossings mean at each border or at, for each actor, there is a potential number of problems. To overcome this, within the regional framework, Turkey and Azerbaijan initiated a number of two plus one meetings with Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Georgia. Some other countries like Romania can be added to this. And EU can step up efforts here by also what Julian touched upon, it's called soft in infrastructure, meaning uh, border checkpoints, procedures, streamlining of trade, protocols, standards. EU does have a capacity here. And uh, I think uh, it can be used as a capacity building. Another issue is uh, critical infrastructure protection. We have seen from Nord Stream what it can happen to pipelines when they are not properly protected or when there is some risks. Similar risks remain uh, for the region, especially volatile regions like South Caucasus. And when it comes to transportation also, uh, with the maritime security, you know there were some mining incidents as a result of uh, uncontrolled sea mines uh, having risks for navigation safety in the Black Sea. So we are on the same page, there are challenges, and the Russian war there exacerbates those challenges, not only for Ukraine, 
but also for the countries in the region, primarily Black Sea countries, uh, such as Turkey with the longest coast and Turkish Straits, but also for countries like Romania and Moldova in the region. Ray, thank, thank you very much. And um, before coming to um, uh, Stefan Wolf um, uh, shortly, I just wanted to put um, two or three further questions, if I may, to others on the panel. We're starting to get questions in on the Q&A, um, function, and I'll take um, one or two of those just now, and maybe add, if I may, a couple from my side, and just give a chance to panelists to pick and choose um, the, the ones that they're comfortable responding on. Um, we've had uh, a question from Paul Vanderen, the former uh, EU ambassador, um, who asked Rilke um, about the impact, the developments in the Eurasian Union that uh, Rilke was describing might have on the relationship between the EU and the Eurasia Union. Um, so that is one uh, question part, if we could come back on in a, in a moment. If I may to, um, and I suppose it's one that's going to edge more towards uh, Leila, but anyone feel free to come back. I'd be particularly interested in comments on um, the situation in Georgia at the moment and the role and the stance really that Georgia, the Georgian government has adopted um, uh, uh, in the war on Ukraine. Maybe not if you were going back 10 years ago, not one that you might have expected a government in Tbilisi to have adopted, but kind of hed hedging its bets in some respects. Um, I I'd be interested uh, both in terms of um, uh, how crucial you know, Georgia is to certainly the middle corridor uh, dimension. And also, uh, um, if you could just uh, comment as well on the speculation around the uh, plans now to move into another gear and develop the Anaklia port uh, uh, project on uh, the Black Sea. And uh, another question, I, I, I suppose, which is more uh, one for uh, Julian, um, it would really be because you were underlining one of the key aims of the uh, European Political Community Summit uh, as focused on connectivity. I just wondered if you could say a, f a, f a bit more about your expectations uh, with that summit, which is just to begin at the uh, at beginning of June. And um, also on the energy side, um, any comments you could share on the interrelationship currently with Transnistria, um, um, just as a case in point, uh, because we've touched on the issue of, of so-called frozen conflict, but the sort of one de facto one plus one um, that Chisinau and Tiraspol are engaged in, uh, and not least because of uh, uh, mutual interest in the energy and uh, electrification uh, sphere. But if I may uh, part those cluster of questions and then we'll come back for another round. Thank you. And Giray, sorry if you have to leave us before uh, there's a chance. Rilke, maybe, if you wanted to kick off. Yes, thank you very much, Craig. Uh, and uh, I addressed, broadly speaking, those questions. Uh, we will be in touch once again. Thanks for organizers. I have to leave to catch up with another meeting. Thank you again. Thank you. So, R R Rilke, please do feel free to come back. Um, so, the question was about how the changes that I described uh, with regard to Russia's vision and uh, Russia's partners' constraints might affect. Um, the relationship between the EU and the Eurasian Union. Um, going back to 2014, 2015, there was a lot of uh, kind of political uh, momentum within the European Union to perhaps engage with the Eurasian Economic Union as a way of depoliticizing de relations with Russia, sort of uh, pr promoting peace through finding a kind of technocratic uh, option. Um, and focusing on economic cooperation and uh, kind of de-stressing uh, international relations. Um, 
we've seen that all the changes have uh, made the whole context a lot more difficult. So in one word, I think it is even less likely than it was the case back in 2014, 2015. A, because we actually have no uh, real clarity as to how the Eurasian Union is going to develop. Um, A, whether Russia will actually invest uh, in the changes necessary. B, uh, whether the partners of Russia would actually agree to such a shift in uh, deepening and political development of the Eurasian Economic Union. And, and also the whole project has become very closely connected to, to the whole kind of Putinism and the whole uh, Putin's ideology of, of um, running the country and, and wanting to run the region. Um, and the European Union also needs to ask itself, um, is the Eurasian Economic Union at all uh, dedicated to liberalization at the moment? There are a lot of questions that suggest that liberalization is actually not a priority. Um, what are the implications of uh, hegemony, Russia's hegemony, and shift to coercion, and obviously the whole question of values. So it's just in the foreseeable future, I, I would struggle to see it as a, a viable uh, way forward, which is not to say that the European Union shouldn't um, seek to develop bilateral links with uh, certainly countries such as Kazakhstan um, and, and other partners. I mean, we know relationships with Belarus are strained in any event, um, but uh, it doesn't mean that the EU shouldn't uh, actually seek to develop a more strategic vision with regard to Russia's partners. Rilke, that, thank you very much. And I, I don't know whether Leila or... Um, uh, Yunan wanted to come in next um, to pick up on some questions. Maybe I can refer briefly um, on those two questions. First, about the EPC summit. Uh, well, um, there are three topics which will be addressed there. Peace and security, just to continue on the discussions in, uh, in, in Prague, but also to reflect you know, the updates and the current developments in, the, in, uh, in Ukraine and the Russian aggression and see how how European leaders can uh, can further you know contribute to to helping uh, to support Ukraine, uh, energy and climate. That is the second uh, topic, um, but probably more with the focus on the energy uh, and connectivity. Uh, so there are th three three topics, and uh, of course the expectation from the summit uh, uh, should be very moderate in the sense that we will not have any kind of a declaration of a summit or kind of a resolution. This is not uh, the format. Uh, the uh, the leaders liked very much, you know, the the flexibility and uh, the comfort uh, to interact and to discuss without, you know, bureaucratic procedures of uh, adopting texts, uh, which usually happens in the kind of formal uh, uh, summits of, uh, of of in various of institutions. And I think that is the added value of this uh, summit. It really provides you the venue to have this high level exchange uh, and to pre cook some important decisions that can be taken further uh, in various uh, structures in the EU or in bilateral formats. It also provides a good opportunity for you know, side, side interactions uh, between various uh, countries. Uh, and uh, well, uh, my personal expectation is that indeed uh, the summit can, can help. Uh, uh, to you know, put forward some new initiatives or improve them, uh, the ones which are currently being developing, really targeting uh, to create some benefits uh, to the citizens. Um, uh, and uh, again, uh, uh, reconstruction of Ukraine will be an implicit su uh, subject because uh, when you look at all topics, basically, uh, uh, the silver lining is very much connected to, to that. Now, on the second part of the question on energy, uh, first I have to mention that uh, for the uh, in the last year we have seen uh, radical changes uh, when it when when talking about the energy um, uh, resistance, the resilience of, of 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 Moldova in general. Uh, in one year, uh, uh, due to Russia using energy, uh, weaponizing energy, Blake using it as a, as a pressure on Moldova, uh, 
after the first first uh, this type of signals we had in 2021 in autumn before the increased energy prices crisis and so on and so forth uh, over the last year what we have seen uh, a coordinated effort with the EU and other international partners to uh, help Moldova to develop alternatives uh, and to increase the energy resilience of the country and what happened uh, basically uh, with the budget uh, um, up to about half a billion euro uh, um, that included uh, you know cash uh, from European financial institutions like EBRD as well as direct budget support to to mitigate increased energy prices on vulnerable groups in my country with that uh, Moldova managed to go through the winter uh, because uh, last year in autumn uh, we were not sure how how that will, will go with an increased energy prices uh, but what happened finally thanks to uh, this uh, coordinated effort uh, Moldova managed for the first time in 33 years 34 years almost of our independence uh, we managed to uh, increase our energy independence from a Russia gas supplies. And uh, practically over the last six months, uh, Moldova is not consuming Russian uh, gas, uh, Moldova with the exception of the Transnistrian region. That is to mention. Uh, that it was possible because uh, um, uh, the government managed to secure funds uh, to buy gas on the market. Mm -hmm to store it in Ukraine and Romania, and that is something that is, is happening now. Of course, the second component is very much linked to that is electricity, and this is where Transnistrian region comes. Um, uh, Moldova has very little capacities of energy production, uh, about 25% of, uh, of, uh, of, of capacities. Uh, the majority of the, of the electricity, which is, it is produced in Transnistrian region, uh, and uh, the Kuchurgan power plant, which is owned by Inter AOS, a Russian, a Russian company, was the main basically supplier uh, before the war. Uh, and uh, after the war started, continue to be uh, uh, the biggest supplier because Ukraine, due to uh, uh, the uh, attacks by Russia's rockets of the Ukrainian electricity infrastructure, Ukraine had to stop exporting electricity. And basically what happened is that Moldova started to buy uh, all the electricity from Kuchurgan. However, what happened uh, uh, in the meantime and helped Moldova to seek for alternatives and increase our, again, electricity <laughs> independence uh, was that a few, few days, as mentioned, after the war, Moldova joined the NSOE together with Ukraine and connected to the grids of the EU, which were very helpful uh, especially uh, in autumn last year, when uh, 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 Tiraspol, uh, the Kuchugan power plant, suspended the supply of, of electricity to Moldova. Why? Because, uh, well, formally Russia has decreased basically the supply of gas, and gas is the main uh, source for production of electricity. And because they had a deficit of gas in Transnistrian region, they basically decided to suspend the production of extra electricity and not sell it to, 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 to Moldova. So for about a month, a month and a half, Moldova was uh, out of options, uh, of traditional options. And what happened is that thanks to Moldova's connection to the EU grid, uh, Moldova managed to secure uh, the ne ne necessary supply of electricity from EU market, from Romania. So basically for about a month, we have been consuming uh, all our needs uh, from Romania, again, on subsidized price, because some of the amounts of the, of the supplies from Romania were subsidized by the government as a support for Moldova to resist you know, the, the crisis. Uh, but that also didn't last it a lot, a, a lot for a long time, why? Because while we have been having connection, only one connection to Romania, and that's uh, uh, a vulnerability in terms of security of supply. So we've had to have two connections. And um, because of that, uh, when uh, the blackouts happened in Ukraine, when the rockets uh, started to attack Ukraine, uh, our system was also affected. So we had blackouts in, in the whole country and that it was happening before the winter time. And at that time we had this you know, uncertainty in terms of gas supply. Uh, and we had uncertainty of electricity supply. What happened at the end of the day uh, was that Kishino and Tiraspol agreed uh, to resume supply, and that was basically happening after Moldova decided to uh, basically uh, 
uh, let all the gas from gas uh, that uh, was uh, halved in supply, uh, the rest of it uh, to go only to the Transnistrian region. And the exchange was that uh, Kuchurgan was started, started to deliver uh, electricity on, again, on, on quite cheap price if to compare with the energy, with, with, with the market price, so basically in half, uh, which helped us Again, with uh, uh, about uh, 10 to 20 percent of supplies from Romania, plus the rest of supplies mm -hmm. from from Kuchurgan, it helped us to resist uh, the winter. But uh, and also with not an increased pressure on the on the price uh, due to the uh, uh, decreased uh, uh, you know prices from Kuchurgan. But the, why I'm saying this because uh, when talking about Kishinev and Tiraspol, um, and here I will conclude. Uh, the observation I had is that since the war started, the Raspo authorities uh, um, were, were sending signals uh, that they're not interested into, into escalation of the war. They were quite, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 sending very clear signals that they, they do not want to have any, any, any escalation. And uh, uh, Kishno, under even though being under pressure of Russia, you know, legal presence of troops, uh, presence of uh, and dependency on the, on the, on the gas and so on and so forth, but still, uh, uh, due to this interdependency between Kishinev and Tiraspol, um, um, uh, and again, obviously, since the war started, Transnistrian region is 100% dependent on the on the rest of Moldova uh, in terms of supply of trade of everything. Everything goes through. Moldova to, to the region, uh, uh, which was not the case as it was before the war. So there is this interdependency between mm -hmm. Kishinev and Tiraspol, and there is a joint interest, interest uh, uh, to maintain uh, the stability and peace. Uh, also, because, uh, I mean, in time, uh, those small steps policy of, of uh, confidence building between Kishinev and Tiraspol, including in trade uh, facilitation, I mean, uh, uh, application of the DCFTA in Transnistrian region, all that helps to increase, you know, the connecti the, 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 the linkage between uh, Tiraspol and the rest uh, of Moldova with two thirds of trade and uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, Moldova being still dependent on the uh, electricity supply, so that independence helped to keep, you know, stability there. Uh, because the, in Tiraspol, what we have, we have a group of uh, basically uh, uh, a business group of interests, uh, which is controlling the region. Uh, and they're very much dependent on the opportunity and the possibility to trade and to maintain, you know, uh, their 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 revenues, and that is, in a way, if you want, kind of a, a counterbalance uh, to Russia's influence in the region. So there is kind of a uh, this uh, uh, leadership in the region, obviously, is not willing, to, you know, to 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 engage the region into the war. Uh, because that will affect their business interests as well. So, and also, I mean, need to look in the future. Uh, I'm not sure people in, I mean, the leadership in Transnistrian region uh, would be willing to be replaced some kind of by some kind of a push, like it was in Donetsk. So they don't want to lose, you know, the their 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 influences, and that is something which helps in a way to maintain kind of a uh, a more pragmatic approach, and at the same time maintaining st stability and peace, and which is encouraging very much now the one-to-one -one discussion. But that is very much temporary, and of course, what we just finally to to to, to mention, what we see the government is doing now is looking towards a more long-term vision of reintegration of the country and see how uh, these inter independencies as well can be used, you know, to better structure. Uh, the vision for the integration of the country, also in the context of the war uh, and uh, of the outcomes of, the, of this war. Julian, thank you for, very much for that very sort of full full set of insights there. Um, and uh, Leila, I just wanted, you know, shifting the focus back to the South Caucasus, um, if you could come back with uh, some comments on the Georgia situation. Also, um, uh, before we come to Stefan Wolf, um, you know, one of the issues we were going to be looking at um, is, you know, China's Belt and Road, um, a, a business model that seems to be built on uh, debt for equity. Um, and um, I'd just be interested, Leila, in terms of uh, in the South Caucasus, how you see that uh, Belt and Road initiative um, uh, kind of viewed and going forward. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. I think the reaction to the war, I think that was your question uh, uh, by Georgia. And you actually mentioned that Georgia was hedging um, 
I think it's a result of a few factors and not only of Georgia, but I, I think it's a result of the perception of relative power of the country vis-a-vis -vis Russia on the one hand and dependency as well as vulnerability to Russia's pressure. Uh, as I said, connectivity um, choices, as well as political um, choices, they're, uh, they're uh, connected with risks uh, for the countries in the South Caucasus. Uh, the risks were clearly demonstrated, um, not only in the 90s, which I mentioned, uh, with assassination attempts on uh, let's say uh, Aliyev and Shevardnadze due to the choices of connectivity choices. Um, uh, but uh, even the war in Ukraine itself, it's already a warning. Um, the um, Russia is just raising to uh, zero the country uh, for making the choice. And um, so I think hedging has became rather a norm, but not only from the point of view of uh, uh, threat situation, but also from domestic development. So speaking about liberal logic, the institutional development, we know that the uh, elite um, in uh, Georgia uh, is quite related economically to Russia. And, uh, you know, the laws which were close to be adopted, but thanks to the uh, societal pressure were not like uh, foreign agent law and things like that. So certain trends, domestic trends are also contributing to this hedging um, uh, sort of hedging policies. Um, there is also uh, uh, concern that Russia uh, promoting the uh, um, the communication via Abkhazia is also uh, trying to get more control. Um, and in general, Russia's presence, increased presence um, after 2020. Uh, now Russia is also in uh, uh, Azerbaijan, which was not the case before that, um, uh, Russia's in uh, increased presence uh, on the ground uh, is perceived as an additional uh, pressure factor and uh, threat to uh, the countries there. Um, so my perception is uh, that uh, Georgia is now also uh, is uh, concerned with loss of its um, key uh, uh, role in the strategic uh, connectivity, um, strategic projects, um, uh, Bakut Bilisi Jehan, Bakut Bilisi Erzrum, Bakut Bilisi Kars. Um, if the uh, probably the direction, uh, the the link connecting uh, Azerbaijan with Nakhchivan through Armenia would be restored, that would mean the alternative route as well. So Georgia might lose uh, some sort of significance in this regard. Um, so that's my reading, uh, whatever happens in Georgia. Leila, thank you very much. Uh, um... Very useful. And at this point, I think uh, it'd be useful to draw in um, Stefan Wolf, if, if we may, um, for any kind of uh, comments and uh, key questions that come to mind from your side. Uh, Stefan, the floor is yours. Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Craig, and, and thank you to all the people who have spoken uh, before me. I think it's very interesting if you sort of uh, take the glass half empty rather than half full. I think you can come up with a lot of reasons why uh, the middle corridor may not actually hold the promise that um, uh, it is frequently uh, set to uh, hold. And I think what's really interesting in this context is if we actually look at where the middle corridor leads, not in Europe, but at the uh, other end in uh, China. And if we look at how China is actually positioning itself in this sort of new geopolitical and geoeconomic game of uh, connectivity. And um, in his opening remarks, Craig had already pointed uh, to sort of various uh, summits going on, whether it's uh, Xi'an or uh, Hiroshima or the uh, Arab League summit in, uh, in Jeddah. And um, 
one of my uh, um, takeaways from that is that uh, China is on the one hand obviously diversifying, and that is very much a result of the difficulty that it is facing in the northern corridor as a result of the war in uh, Ukraine. But I also think it is still hedging. Uh, and um, what I mean by that is that um, if we look at the bigger picture here, I mean, the investments that have been announced uh, in the, um, uh, at the summit in uh, Xi'an between uh, China and the five Central Asian states, I mean, they put a lot of emphasis uh, onto um, sort of transport infrastructure. So whether that's uh, the uh, China, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan uh, railway, whether it's uh, the re-upping of the ports on the uh, Caspian Sea. Um, but none of that necessarily means uh, middle corridor. Um, so China has uh, overland alternatives uh, through the West Asia corridor. And I think here it's also important to bear in mind uh, that China has become much more active in uh, Middle East uh, diplomacy. Um, so uh, China's role in brokering um, some sort of um, well, reset maybe is going a bit too far, but sort of uh, bringing Saudi Arabia and Iran uh, more closely together, I think is a um, uh, is a very interesting move. And if you compare that with the relatively limited role that um, China, for example, plays in the conflicts in the South Caucasus, uh, again, I think sort of that is an indication that China is not necessarily settled massively on uh, the middle uh, corridor. And finally, I think we also have to bear in mind here that obviously within the Caspian uh, uh, Sea, Russia is still a major naval power and the pressure that uh, Russia is able to exert, for example, on Kazakhstan uh, uh, in relation to um, the uh, Kazakh uh, pipelines uh, through the Caspian, um, I think that's potentially a concern uh, for China uh, as well. Uh, the military uncertainty in the Black Sea, um, the lack of a deep sea port in uh, uh, Georgia. Uh, again, that does not necessarily bode well for um, sort of a very vibrant uh, middle corridor. Uh, certainly not in the in the short term, uh, I would say. Um, and the final point, and I'll just mention that here uh, before handing back uh, uh, to Craig. Uh, is of course um, sort of the north-south uh, connections here. And I here I'm thinking less of the uh, Russia-Iran uh, uh, links, but more um, about the links through uh, Afghanistan, for example. And there was a question in the, um, uh, the Q&A uh, about this as well. And given that China now actually has an official policy uh, on Afghanistan, well, they have a position on uh, uh, the situation in Afghanistan, uh, um, 11 points quite similar to um, to the policy on uh, on Ukraine in, in, in some ways. I think that also indicates that China is uh, desperately looking for uh, alternatives um, partially to the uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor, which is uh, exposed to quite a lot of instability, um, but also, again, trying to um, consider different routes that would also link uh, the Central Asian uh, uh, economies better to the um, uh, sort of global economy, um, for example, through Afghanistan and then ports um, at the Arabian uh, Sea. So I think from, from that perspective, what I think we need to consider, broadly speaking, is sort of the eastern end uh, uh, of the middle corridor and what is going on there and the potential sort of southern alternatives uh, uh, to the middle corridor that um, in some ways are already much more developed uh, than what we would see through this quite costly multimodal uh, transportation uh, route that the middle corridor through uh, the South Caucasus would uh, represent. Thank you. Stefan, thank you, not only for, you know, those wider contextual uh, points you made, uh, but also, yes, uh, some of the, the challenges and uh, caveats that need to be borne in mind um, around the middle corridor. Um, I wondered really, as time is press pressing, and um, I'm very grateful to uh, to those who put questions on the Q and A function, and not least that wider one about what about the wider region and the impact on countries like 
uh, Afghanistan. But I just wondered in the final few moments to give the panelists a chance to come back on um, any of those points that Stefan was making there. Um, and I wondered also if you could um, uh, include any reflections or thoughts on, on Belt and Road Initiative uh, in terms of the paradigm that it appears to be built on, you know, this debt for equity and that a number of stakeholders ending up in considerable debt. Um, and that is obviously a, not a very transparent area uh, when one's trying to drill down. Um, but I suppose the phrase that really resonates from the G7, um, uh, and obviously there, were, there was uh, uh, criticism and caution on China, but it was actually uh, putting out there uh, the de-risking but not decoupling from China. And I think um, that, uh, for me anyway, in terms of the summary of last week, was uh, was a major takeaway. But anyway, just to give the panelists the chance um, in the final uh, uh, moments of the webinar to come back, uh, particularly on any comments they had uh, with with Stefan's uh, remarks. Uh, please feel free, uh, Rilke first, or uh... um, just to thank you, Rilke, for the we've seen that connectivity is facilitated, potentially facilitated by uh, Russia-led Eurasian integration um, may continue to tick on some level, but it ultimately has become hostage to, to, to Russia's aggression, uh, which makes it quite a difficult uh, predicament uh, for uh, partners such as Kazakhstan, Armenia, Kyrgyzstan, and did, there just isn't an easy way out. Uh, obviously, what they've tried to do is to uh, diversify, seek alternative routes, um, re-enliven the kind of south or, or middle corridors, uh, but ultimately they are very mindful of not rocking the boat uh, and exposing themselves to um, direct aggression. Um, I mean, the role of China and, and India and, and uh, actually countries such as even Egypt and, and you know, other regional actors, Turkey, um, that is certainly becoming more interesting. Um, I mean, there was the latest summit, continuing your uh, story crying about summits uh, in March, um, 2023 between um, the leaders of China and Russia, um, which seemed to kind of suggest an, an upping and a new level of relationship between China and Russia. Uh, but as, as one commentator um, described it very aptly, it was more of a loud thunder with, with uh, few raindrops really. So that doesn't seem to necessarily suggest anything more than um, actually a continuation of a sort of more openly asymmetric relationship um, uh, and, and um, China's continued um, dealing with um, the countries in the region uh, actually on a more of a bilateral mm -hmm. basis, which of course allows it and, and uh, amplifies the questions that you suggested, Craig, uh, in terms of debt dependency, not just in debt dependency, a lot of other questions, not least, you know, environmental degradation and, and, and others. Um, so I, I think that requires certainly um, uh, the US and, and G7 more broadly to develop a, a more agile uh, strategy as to how to deal with uh, the kind of new landscape of Eurasia. And, and um, whilst this de-risking uh, without decoupling <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a very good um, indication of the direction of travel, uh, I think we still need a lot of detail uh, and extensive dialogue uh, with, uh, you know, 
countries such as Armenia, Kazakhstan, and, and others in the region. Thank you so much, uh, Rilke. And um, Leila, um, if uh, you and Julian didn't mind uh, a minute each, and then we will, under this solid chairmanship, <laughs> uh, manage to draw a line at uh, 11.30. Uh, Leila. Uh, thank you so much. I think the countries in the region benefit from competition between various actors. And that's why the more projects they are, including the one from China, um, the more various projects, uh, I think uh, there is a great opportunity for them to raise their value uh, as uh, the countries, as a leaders, as regional hubs. Um, so that's, I think, the main uh, conclusion. Also, there, uh, China is too far um, on a distance. It's also culturally quite far, so they don't see it as a threat in terms of uh, political influence or um, identity issues are not involved here. So, um, yeah, so that, that's my conclusion on the issue of the South Caucasus and also that they... Um, Probably we we are entering a, a quite favorable period, and that's why you can see the acceleration of the mediation processes. And it's really very quick and fast uh, because this is a unique opportunity to use both the um, connectivity issues for the peace uh, establishment of peace and promotion of peace, and also the. Uh, sign the peace agreement in order to promote uh, alternative uh, connectivity and diversification. So thank you. Thank you, Leila. And finally, uh, Julian. Yeah, briefly, uh, I think one should prioritize uh, the interventions and that is not only looking at uh, you know medium to long-term kind of uh, connectivity projects, uh, but one should also uh, focus very much on the immediate needs um, uh, that impact a lot uh, the whole Europe. When you talk about you know transport infrastructure, uh, I, I don't I don't take, talk here about the, the security implications. Uh, uh, not to mention them. Uh, so one, I mean, now I think it's very clear that uh, the Russian aggression against Ukraine has impacted a lot and continues to impact uh, the whole you know. Uh, transportation chain and and food uh, food exportation chain and grain deals which have been you know prolonged for for not for every every month or every two months so there is an uncertainty there so beyond looking at you know long term projects i think one should look at at the current needs and see the best ways to address them i talk about the leaders in the region uh, and of course, the EU has a huge uh, role in that sense, uh, being one of the main contributors to these kind of uh, programs and projects, uh, as we have seen. And Solidarity Lens is one of them. Um, and second point I want to make is, uh, uh, while looking at, you know, and to, to repeat, I think, uh, while looking at the hard projects, uh, one should not forget about the soft component of it, which is procedures, uh, which... Uh, uh, also takes time when you talk about harmonization of transit, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, rules, um, it takes time. Uh, exchange of information uh, uh, of countries which are not, in not integrated in the, in the you know, uh, transportation lane or so, so forth. So this is the second point I want to make. And finally, uh, every, every this type of intervention should you know, uh, aim, aim to produce to improve the better life of people uh, uh and that should be the main the main the main goal of it thank you thank you very much uh thank you it really uh thank remains you. me to um express gratitude to all the speakers for the very rich and insightful uh overview you've given us today also thank you to everyone who's uh stayed with the call and um i hope you've uh, found uh these perspectives and um insights uh, of use. So uh, until the next time, thank you very much for joining today with the Foreign Policy Centre. Thank you.